Hello? Okay, Steve, live streaming. Hi. We're live streaming. Just every... Hi, Steve. Yeah. Are you ready for me? Just Hello? Yeah, thank you. Can we uh... Andrew, it's um, you're frozen. It's Andrew, it's echo echoing, mate. Just okay, let me just yeah. <laughs> can everybody mute, please, for a minute. Please, can everybody mute? You want me to go? Just... Everybody mute, please, for a minute. Please, can everybody mute? You want me to go? Uh, Steve, just mute yourself for the moment. Yep. Put your sound up here, sir. Yeah. Is that your sound up there? Down there. Oh. Oh. That wasn't sound. That's... Wow. That's a to turn off. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, here we are. It's okay. No, that's not good. No, there's no, a sound. No sound. Sound. Yep. Yeah. Now you got to cross against the sound now, Sue. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there we are. How do you turn? Oh, this is this side is this the is sound. Yeah, this is sound. Andrew. There it is. You're yes, Steve. Um, you we're getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, yeah, but you because you're right, streaming directly off YouTube on your machine. So can you can. How do we fix that? Yeah, I'm just trying to get back into you, so just bear with yeah, you. Just do what you got to do. Yep. Apologize, everyone. Yes, sir. Andrew, we're right to go now. <coughs> Madam Chair, we're live. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this meeting of the Huntersville Local Planning Panel. My name is Leslie Finn and I am the chair of today's panel. With me on the panel today are Mr Chris Young, a town planner, Mr Ron Edgar, planner and architect, and Mr Philip Hart, who is the representative from the community. None of the panel members have a conflict of interest in the matter that is before the panel today. And I should advise you that this meeting is being both recorded and videoed and will be available on YouTube. Could I also ask you to mute yourselves, please, while other people are speaking so that everybody can have a fair chance of being heard. 
Now, each speaker will be given three minutes. However, might I ask that in the interests of keeping the meeting on track time-wise, that if somebody before you speak says something with which you agree, then there is no need to repeat the submission. It is sufficient to say that you agree with whatever speaker it was, because I assume you'll all be listening. Now, the application before today's panel is for a, a construction of a two-storey sports and community facility within the southern portion of Baronia Park, and it is to be located between Obels 1 and 2. Now, I understand Mr Mark Meyer uh, wishes to speak first. So, Mark, I'll... Uh, you could unmute yourself and you have three minutes and I understand that you are objecting to the proposal. So perhaps if you could let us have your thoughts within our three minute time limit, please. Yes, I'll attempt to do this. Is, am I ready to go? Yes, you're ready to go. Good afternoon to all. My name is Mark Myers and I am a resident and rate payer of Hunters Hill Council for 63 years. I'm here to support the Save Baronia Park submission and to voice my opposition to the proposed rugby club development. I support the opposers' issues in their entirety, but also wish to express my additional concerns. This is the fourth attempt in 12 years for proposed development of this site. Three previous attempts have proved unsuccessful. 30 years ago, in 1991, town clerk then, W. Phipson, outlined town plans for this site for conservation and heritage trust. And it was designated as a Harbour Foreshores Scenic Protection Area. I have this letter as evidence and I still have this letter to support this action. Due to the recent effect of COVID on local residents' lives, more council resources will be required to be allocated to a range of other services, which benefit the greater community rather than prioritising a rugby club for a, similar, for a smaller number of locals. We should be concerned about financial transparency and the controls of the building entity as proposed. This is part of due process has not yet been attended to. Who will control their actual usage? Private or public entities. There is little or no information other than what appears to be the Hunters Hill Rugby Club, in which I see no proven experience of their expertise in fiscal management ability. Excuse Understand me, are you still there? You, your picture's gone off screen. Are you still there? I beg your pardon, no. Are you there? Okay. Keep talking, Mr Meyer, please. Go on. Okay. Please don't interrupt anyone. In which I see no proven experience of their expertise in fiscal management or ability in that direction. They are an amateur club. If the budget is exceeded, which is very likely, but only a peppercorn rent is being charged, then who will pay or loan the money to cover excess costs? $100 per year is what I've heard for the next 20 or 30 years. Seems ridiculously low. We need accountability and transparency. What is the source of these funds? Do we want a repeat of the Wagga Gun Club Daryl Maguire, Gladys Berejokian, alleged $5 million in propriety, still to be resolved by a government inquiry. Will this become a similar issue to Wyong Council's $600 million, $600 million debt in their amalgamation with Gosford Shire to be picked up by ratepayers? What will be the financial role of the Hunters Hill Council or Hunters Hill Rugby Club or cricket club or any other sporting group who will use or benefit from use of the club. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. 
Thank you, Mr. Meyer. The next person registered to speak is Mr. Ben Woods. Are you there, thank Mr. You. Woods? Yep, thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ben Woods, and I'm president of the Ride Hunters Hill Queer Club. Um, like the rugby club, we have over 100 years of history attached to the Baronia Park precinct, and I'm honoured to have the opportunity to talk to you all here today. Our club has over 400 members, 44 teams, most of which are junior teams of girls and boys of under 16 years of age. Our club has maintained a strong presence in the local community for many years, and we're proud to call Baronia Park our home. We're the primary summer, summer tenant, and utilise the precinct extensively in the summer months. Whilst we are proud of the precinct, the reality is the current facilities do not meet the needs of a modern growing community. Our community deserves a modern fit for purpose facility that provides a wonderful legacy for many generations to come. Importantly, the new facility will provide our club with, much, with a much needed home within the precinct. We've enjoyed the collaborative processes to get the project to its current stage, with our fellow sporting clubs, council and consultants, we've all worked very well together. We believe the design will provide much improved amenity to all users, but in particular, it will provide improved amenity and safety for all, our, all the boys and girls in the community. The design outcome reflects compromises reached by all the stakeholders in terms of the location and the design. And we feel that design is particularly sympathetic towards the surrounding environment. Whilst the sporting clubs are arguably the driving force behind this project, we very much view this as a legacy project for the whole community. The benefits that this project will provide to all stakeholders are arguably immeasurable. They are so great in our view. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you very much, Mr. Woods. The next person registered to speak is Kathy Merchant. Is Kathy there? Unmute might help as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's difficult to make rational comment on the political and opaque process that has driven this DA. From the government grants and the MOU, preparation of a new plan of management, a DA exhibited in the final days of the extended council period. The need for a transparent and rigorous environmental assessment is critical. The local council is the future regulator with a long term access agreement. Uh, with a third party for a facility on public land without any public tender process having occurred. The proposed sports and community facility falls between cracks in local controls with its location and scale largely derived from the contentious plan of management 2020. The POM dated May in the SJB report is missing the results of the community survey that did not support the central location for a new building. I now draw your attention to two issues, the exhibition process for the DA and comments on the SJB report. I feel the exhibition process was flawed. There was no notification signage in accordance with planning regulations placed on the site. The set of exhibited documents was incomplete with some dribbled out by council in response to community inquiry. Some only made available in the SJB report post exhibition and some mentioned but not available. Example, the landscape and biodiversity consultants report. No completed DA form clearly indicated landowners consent to specify ownership as New South Wales government and that all documents had been shown to this owner to obtain their consent seems farcical. I feel this DA cannot be validly approved given the limitations in the exhibition process. Finally, SJB presents a circular argument to demonstrate that there has been consideration of the suitability of the site. The argument being that the site is suitable because the new facility is of missable use under RE1, a fact that is arguable if more time. Further, SJB conflates land use zoning with management zones with within the pond. The sport component of the facility, that is, the ancillary buildings could be located elsewhere to meet sport and school needs, and the community component of the, component of the facility seems to be in name only. The independent consultants report from the extensive community consultation that occurred almost 12 months ago to presumably support the DA for the proposed community facility has not been publicly released and is not mentioned in the SJB report. SJP's late inclusion of a draft operational plan is meaningless, as presumably the MOU for long-term access will override its intent. Regardless, the wish list of potential users is not justified with any community needs analysis report. Likewise, meaningless is a landscape plan as part of consent conditions. 
There is no room for eight trees, and how will it take account of the need for access pathways and facilities such as the replacement long jump pit that was removed for the cricket storage shed? There is need for clarification as to whether consent for the facility can be exercised validly on land that is categorised as sports ground under the public land management laws. SJB has not acknowledged the independent public hearing report, hearing report that stated need for general community use categorisation, nor discussed whether any planning consent compromises the integrity of that process. To dismiss the economic impacts of this development on the ratepayers of Hunter's Hill in the absence of an independent business case as outside the S415 scope is flawed and unfair. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Cathy. The next person registered to speak is Matthew Folks. Matthew? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm here. Just turn my camera on. Sorry about oh, that. Yes, now I can see you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and, and to the rest of the panel. My, uh, by means of introduction, my name is Matthew Folks, and I am the local cricket manager for the areas of Hunters Hill Lane Cove and the City of Ryde from Cricket New South Wales. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, about this project today. CNSW recognises that this proposed facility is an essential multi-purpose sport and community asset for the Hunters Hill local government area, which will service not only a, a wide range of local cricket associations and cricket clubs, but has the capability to service a plethora of local sporting organisations and community groups. Looking specifically through the lens of cricket, the facility will service the broader Inner West Harbour Junior Cricket Association and its 13 affiliated clubs, but will also service the Ryan Hunters Hill Cricket Club, as Ben Woods has spoken about previously. The proposed inclusive and modern facility will help further develop the local cricket club and the association's growth within young male and female cricketers within the region. This is aligned to uh, the new CNSW infrastructure strategy, which was implemented in 2020, looking forward to the next 10 years until 2030. And one of the th main things that we received from local stakeholders, which we've implemented into this strategy, is the need for the renewal of ageing infrastructure. It's been identified as a, a top 10 priority for cricket across the state. And I feel in, in this specific instance, this is an e excellent example of how an increased focus on redeveloping infrastructure will really help to put forward cricket as a sport that is for all young boys and girls of all backgrounds and abilities and really will ensure the continual growth within the Hunters Hill LGA of cricket and sport in general. Thank you. Thank you very much Matthew. Uh, Glenn Sanford. Glenn. Good afternoon, I'm Glenn Sanford, President of the Hunter Hill Rugby Club. Thank I'm pleased you. to be here representing the club and to provide positive affirmation for the DA before you today. Our club has over 500 members, the majority of which are children. Much growth in our membership is attributable to more women and girls playing rugby. Bromia Park is Hunter Hill's premier sporting venue. We're all proud of it, but alas, its aged facilities do not meet the needs of the sporting clubs or the community. Today is the culmination of many years of community consultation. This has included presentations and discussions with council and councillors, a feasibility study, discussions with neighbours and interest groups, the extensive plan of management process, participation in the advisory group, multiple public exhibitions, and the extensive design process. The design reflects not only the needs of the sporting clubs and schools that use Baronia Park, but also the wider community. The outcome is a reflection of the compromises reached by all concerned, both in location and design. The new building will provide the opportunity for wider participation in sport by all, in particular women and girls. It will also provide opportunities for other community groups. In short, it will provide new facilities which will be fit for purpose. You may be aware that the clubs have undertaken to raise money to fund the project. We're pleased to say that we have 73% of the money raised or pledged so far. The sports clubs 
to the focus on providing a facility that will put the entire community. Yes, it will provide a home for rebuilding clubs, but we have absolutely no desire to exclude any other community group from taking advantage of it. It is absolutely in the best interest of the facility for it to be used, even better if it is used by a variety of community groups. Its usage will be well within the reasonable social time limits which have been set. Noise will be little different to what is currently experienced, as will the traffic impacts. There will never be a situation where another hire of the facility will occur on a game day. A lot of effort has gone into the fit for purpose design that is before you today. We believe it will provide a wonderful addition to Bronia Park, supporting all forms of sporting and community activities. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Mr. Norm Lurie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I've been a resident of uh, Baronia Park for over 38 years, and I'd like to thank the local planning panel for this opportunity uh, to address this meeting. I'd like to point out that as stakeholders, we were not advised until very late in the piece that this proposed building would include a community facility. It was our understanding from the outset that what was being proposed was a sport and recreational facility, an upgrade to the existing grandstand and a modest home for the Hunters Hill Rugby Club. One of many concerns that I have in relation to a community facility relates to traffic, parking and resultant safety issues. The council has recently commissioned a private roads and tra a traffic report, and that document makes clear a number of problems relating to traffic in Baronia Park, which we've been aware of for many years. Firstly, many of the roundabouts in this precinct are not fit for purpose. Secondly, all of the traffic karmas in this area are not fit for purpose. Thirdly, the route between Pitwater and Ride Roads along High Street and park roads are in constant use by rat runners, keen to avoid traffic lights on pit water and ride roads. Into this area, the proposal outline, as outlined would see even more traffic run through these roads, creating even more of a hazard because cars will be looking to drop off, pick up or park. For children rushing to a game, elderly or physically impaired guests going to a function, this looks like an accident waiting to happen. We have a number of concerns in relation to parking. On a council open day at Brony Park, I spoke with Meg Kong from TTPA, the consultancy group brought in by the council to advise on traffic and parking issues. I was told that no additional parking was required in the event that a community facility was built. This statement beggars belief as there is not sufficient parking currently to meet the needs for current busy sports weekend. I mentioned to her that Baronia Avenue, which is where I live, at its entrance was barely a car and a half wide and that on several occasions, residents were unable to access Ride Road. The main access points to the park, Park Road also, not a very wide road, is also serviced by four separate bus services. It is therefore extremely difficult to find parking along this road. And as a result, players and spectators are often offloaded while drivers pursue a parking spot elsewhere. The current parking lot has no designated pickup or drop off area, something that would not only ensure greater pedestrian safety, but would cater to people with disabilities. Contrary to the council's own statement of environmental effects, we believe that this proposal would raise serious, unreasonable traffic and parking impacts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. And now, uh, Mr. Peter McFarlane. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can see you, Peter, and I can hear you. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm talking today in strong support for the sports and community facility at Bronia Park. The report presented to the panel has picked out a number of issues that were common themes throughout the objecting submissions, and I'd just like to address a few of these. The first is the location of the facility. Um, the primary function of this facility is to support volunteer organisations that promote sport at Bronia Park. 
For this reason, the location is entirely appropriate in the centre of the sports zone, directly servicing the two main ovals, the netball courts and the cricket nets, and with an easy connection to the car park. This location also provides safety for our junior members, being inside of all training areas for all sports and well away from the surrounding main roads. Secondly, there is concerns about noise, but the acoustic assessment shows that the use of the facility falls well within the acceptable levels. This should be, it should be noted that the clubs have had no objections in the imposing of a 10 p.m. curfew on this facility, which is one hour earlier than all other facilities in Hunters Hill. Additionally, the private hiring of the facility has been restricted to daylight hours only, so concerns over weddings and parties are completely unfounded. The third issue I'd like to talk about is parking and traffic. Baronia Park is a premier sporting precinct in Hunters Hill. Its three full-sized ovals, a rare thing in Sydney, gives it regional significance. As such, it attracts thousands of sporting participants and spectators over the course of the year. It has done so for more than 130 years. There has been a suggestion that this proposed facility and the previous speaker spoke to this will increase the pressure on the local road network and on parking. But this suggestion implies that the use of the, the facility will be in addition to the use of Bronia Park for sports. This is completely incorrect. The rugby and cricket clubs are currently in negotiations with council to secure their tenure for the use of Bronia Park. This will include the use of the ovals and the com complementary use of, of the facility. As a result of the agreement, um, the sporting clubs will have access to the facilities during the times they are playing sports on the oval. This means that no private hiring will ever be available during those times. Only the people that are already at Bronia Park for sporting events will be accessing the facilities. Therefore, there will be no increase in traffic and no increase in the need for parking. This facility is long overdue at Bronia Park. It will provide modern facilities to support the volunteer sporting organisations that call it home, provide amenities for the kids at Bronia Park Public School and a place for local community groups to use. It will, prov it will provide a future-proof asset for Hunters Hill. I ask you to please approve this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Richard Wilcock. Is Richard there? Yes, Richard's here. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Chair, I take that my submission is read, although some of the matters that uh, I've raised in my submission uh, have not been responded to at all in the materials that have been published. Today, I'll highlight three matters. The first is the proposal is significantly more than is required, reasonable or appropriate. What's the proposal attempting to address? The business case gives three reasons. The first, which describes as the primary purpose, is to improve toilets and change rooms for the public and for players. The plans foreshadow toilets of 39 square metres and change rooms and first aid of 144 square metres. In my submission, Chair and members, it's not necessary to have such large change rooms for a suburban ground. The change rooms are unlikely to be used frequently during the season and not at all out of season. And in fact, the dimensions of the existing facility could easily accommodate uh, refurbished change rooms and, and, and uh, toilets. The second reason given was to improve facilities for sports equipment storage. The plans foreshadow a whopping 100 and square, 106 square metres of uh, storage and a further 60 square metres of an enclosed area. I point out, Chair and members, that Council's own terms of use of the playing fields oblige hirers to arrange for their own storage of equipment. So I, I believe that saying we need to build more storage is perhaps a bridge too far. The rugby club currently parks its trailer in the car park uh, uh, throughout the year. And while providing the rugby club with, a, with more storage is definitely a good idea if possible, to me, it's not a sufficient reason to proceed with a project of this scale. If necessary, a more modest extension of the existing facility would, would suffice. The third reason given the business case was to create a, a community facility. Now, the plans, Chair, indicate that the facility that's proposed for Baronia Park would be larger, yes, larger than a similar facility at Dremoyne Oval, which is 3.3 k's away. Let's compare the two. Dremoyne Oval hosts AFL games. 
It hosts international cricket. It hosts Sheffield Shield cricket. In fact, there's a game starting on Sunday at Dremoyne Oval. Games are televised at Dremoyne Oval. It hosts first grade rugby league and rugby union. Barania Park does not host any of these things. Dremoyne Oval has 6,000 ticketed capacity. So none of these apply to Barania Park. This is a suburban facility. And what we're talking about here is significantly more than is required. The facility at Dremoyne Oval has capacity for uh, uh, entertainment for up to 80 people or 100 if they're standing up. Barania Park is proposing 220, more than double what exists at Dremoyne Oval. How do the, how the populations compare? The LGA of Canada Bay is roughly seven times larger than that of Hunters Hill. Its operating income is roughly five times larger. Chair and members, this proposal is substantially more than is required, reasonable or appropriate for the Baronia Park playing fields. My second point, financial implications are not sound for the Hunters Hill. The business case itself highlights this risk. Council is accepting a forecast, uh, a forecast operating loss. In its business case, council dismisses the financials as not being relevant. And this, Chair, is with respect disingenuous. The financial viability correlates with the scale of the proposal. A more modest refurbishment of existing facilities would meet the stated primary purpose and not create the financial problem that is very clearly in face in, in front of the council now. And in fact, council's own plan of management goes on to says expressly, quoting, management and development of Baronia Park will ultimately be reliant upon and largely determined by the funding and resources available to council. My third and final point, who is the relevant community in whose interest Baronia Park is being managed? It's an important question this panel needs to consider. There are three possible answers. The 15,000 residents of Hunters Hill, the residents of Baronia Park, or the users of the Baronia Park playing fields. And while I acknowledge the rugby club is a prominent user, I do not believe that it is a relevant community. I also acknowledge that council as the proponent of this proposal is in a tough position. Council is very evidently in favor of the proposal, although I've asked council uh, to, uh, to evaluate a more modest proposal, no reply has been forthcoming. Model good governance practice would suggest that council put as much effort into a no case as it is put into a yes case. The appropriate course, uh, 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 Chair and members, is to invite a more modest proposal and to reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcock. Bridget Dowsett. Bridget? No. Okay, uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, oh, well, I can, yes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm a long-term uh, local resident and have been actively engaged with Council's stated environmental sustainability and heritage objectives over several decades. So I find it baffling that Council has proved so determined to pursue this controversial development proposal only on behalf of the sporting club's ambitions rather than in the broader public interest. I'm object objecting due to the location, style and bulk form for the facility and the consequent social and environmental impacts. It is regrettable that the requirement to revise the 2015 plan of management for Baronia Park conveniently provided the vehicle to promote and entrench the notion of the rugby club's entitlement to have their own building within the central sports zone of our heritage parkland. On the, on the advisory group for revising the plan, of which I was a member, time was taken up discussing the, the location for this clubhouse. It being accepted without question, apparently, that it was a given, not an option. Thus, four locations were proposed. The one selected by the rugby club between Ovals 1 and 2 was not that preferred by the majority responding to Council's community survey with 97 of 103 voters in preference in favor of siting facilities near the grandstand. But council supported the club's preference and then enabled an, indic an indicative siting of 450 square meters within the plan 2020 plan of management, which was then approved. In fact, even this excessive allowance has been exceeded with a long dark footprint 
far too large for the narrow space. There is so much that is wrong with this design concerning its lack of suitability and its inadequate business case. But I want to stress the many aesthetic and environmental impacts from this erroneous choice of place and form. To start with, the life of four healthy mature trees, native trees would be drastically cut short so that this building can occupy the chosen space. A landscape plan is proposed, but where exactly will there be room for eight new canopy trees along this narrow strip? How cynical is this when there was no compelling need to place the building here, except to provide a convenient viewing platform for club members? Next is that council has received the funds for this building from sources that are still the subject of probity investigation. While we're told that pork barreling isn't illegal, does it not matter that most people believe it to be unethical? The funding agreement for the larger grant was intended to help restore the heritage grandstand, but none of the funds are allocated to that. The smaller grant was to provide much needed women's facilities, but this can easily be achieved without the imposition and damaging disruption of this project. Sectional interests are being rewarded with almost exclusive rights a 20 year license and a prime position within our iconic parkland due to their success in accessing funds that council doesn't have to build something that most rate payers have no interest in or don't even want. But we do know we will be bearing the maintenance and ongoing costs because the building design is inadequate to function as a hired venue. There's no proven demand by community groups for its use and as for entertaining over 200 people there, there's only one toilet on that upper level and you need to go outside the building to reach the other toilets. So where is the presumed income stream? The panel may judge this DA acceptable because the development fits with the council's approved plan of management, but it was a poor process that achieved this and it's made worse by legitimate objections pertaining to other community and environmental matters being viewed as irrelevant. Residents are losing trust in their local and state decision makers. The project will have a corrosive legacy that it does not impact on Baronia Park's character and amenity is strenuously disputed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we have Emily Tan. Is Emily there? Yes, thank you. I'm Emily Yan, and I speak on behalf of members of the Baroni Park Action Group. I would like to express my concern about noise, especially noise and amplified music from sports gatherings and parties in the community space and the open terrace on the second level. The acoustic report has specified that in order to comply with the noise emissions goals, the external doors must remain closed before 7 a.m. and after 6 p.m. However, I'm not at all confident that users will comply with this and it will not be monitored or enforced. The large terrace area is open and not sound insulated. This is in direct contrast to general community expectation of greater control of noise during the more sensitive early morning and late nighttime periods. The council said to call the police if anyone breaks the rules. This is simply irresponsible and suggests a lack of commitment to actively monitor the noise impact to the community. The design and location of the building has not allowed for sufficient passive acoustic control, but rather relies on human volition to follow noise restrictions. Noise control is meaningless if the doors and louvers are not closed as recommended, or if music volume exceeds limits. The 10 p.m. closing time six days a week is far too late, especially for weeknights. It's past the bedtime of many residents, especially children. Residents on Park Road and Baronia Avenue are basically expected to hear up to 220 sports players bid their goodbyes on the streets past 10 p.m with car doors opening and closing, and to be woken up by 6 a.m. the next morning by fitness users as they arrive. This repeating six and a half days a week. I strongly oppose to having the open terrace. Functions and parties should occur in an enclosed space, given the proximity to local residences. 
Also, there needs to be high performance acoustic louvers as opposed to the operable ones in the plan. Double glazing should be also considered. In addition, on the consultation day on the 30th of May this year, the acoustic engineer suggested to us three possible measures to control noise. Number one is to have a sound limiter that cuts the, blood, uh, cuts the power supply to sound equipment if the noise exceeds the limit. Number two, a traffic light noise monitoring indicator. It turns red when they're too loud. Number three, automatic doors that close at 6 p.m. These measures were curiously left out of the DA, but should be essential. This project has not shown any respect to the community. It should not be approved. We just want to live our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, John Boast. Are you there, John? Yes, I am. Thank you. And, and thank you for the opportunity to address this panel. I'm an architect and project manager with some 40 years experience. My wife and I have lived in Park Road opposite number one oval since 1999. Let me be clear, we fully support the council's efforts to update and increase change room and storage facilities for all sports that use the park. However, we do not have, we do have very strong objections to the inclusion of the so-called community facility right in the middle of the park as part of this development. The location in the center of the park has several significant disadvantages. Placing a two-story building right in the center of this space will forever adversely affect the entire park visually, functionally, and environmentally. The congregation of people in the area where rugby balls are kicked for goals and cricket balls fly over the fence will be a clear and ever-present danger to spectators, especially children. The tiered seating and the large terrace are an expensive nonsense considering rugby fans never watch games from behind the posts. Access between and around the ovals for casual users, users will be lost on football days as spectators are squeezed into a thin area. This will make through access a trial, if not impossible. The location goes against all planning parameters for sports grounds. Spectator amenities should be separated by safe distances from the playing areas, preferably next to the sidelines. The building has an exaggerated footprint. The location next to the Telco building allows for an additional open storage area, adding to the total footprint of the building. It also exaggerates the length of the building as the surrounding walls are included in the ground level facade. While the architects have attempted to limit the apparent height of the building by having a low pitched metal roof, it does nothing to complement the heritage listed grandstand. A builder's site area indicating the plans is totally inadequate, especially for material storage and cranes and additional space in the car park or an oval number two will be required during construction. The car park will need to be closed to allow maneuvering space for large trucks entering the site. The old car park surface has not been designed to take these high loads and rectification of the car park has not been addressed in the DA. The EPA Act states that this panel must take into consideration the likely impacts of the development, including social and economic impacts in the locality, the suitability of the site for the development and the public interest. This development will have significant negative impacts that will be felt by residents permanently. For example, the noise mitigation measures in the acoustic report are merely suggestions and are not addressed in the DA. The report for, fails to take into consideration the noise generated by users outside the facility. This small site is totally unsuitable for this kind of overdevelopment and the approval of a community centre is definitely not in the public interest. There are many other environmental heritage and social reasons to object to this development. And I'll leave these objections for others with special expertise to explain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Ben Chaplin. Ben. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to address the panel today. My name is Ben Chaplin, and I'm a long-time resident of Henley and now Gladesville. I am pleased to speak in support of the development application in its proposed form. The facility proposed is a flexible space catering for all community members and it is adaptable for the changing needs of the future. It is fit for purpose for the sporting groups and is sensibly located in keeping with the Baronia Park plan of management. It is sympathetic to the surrounding landscape and in my opinion, will be a beautiful addition to the park. I commend council on the thorough process undertaken to prepare the design. 
Throughout the extensive plan and management process, Council undertook regular public consultation to land on the broader parameters of the building, the size, location and general offering of the facility. Following this process, Council established a stakeholder working group to advise Council's architect in, delivering, in developing the detailed design, internal layouts, functional requirements, etc. As a playing member of the rugby club, I was happy to be a part of this working group and was able to share my experience having played for many years at Bronia Park and also having played at many facilities across Sydney. It is no secret that the current facilities of Bronia Park are not up to modern standards. Thanks to the collaboration with Council and its architect, the proposed facility will be well equipped to serve the community and its sporting groups, as it now incorporates the minimum requirements set out in the facility design guidelines from the relevant peak sporting bodies, Rugby Australia, Cricket Australia, etc. I repeat, the change rooms and toilets are no greater than the minimum standards set out in the guidelines for community-based sports facility. One thing I've noticed playing a variety of grounds is the importance of an indoor community space to gather at the ground with teammates and opposition. I've noticed that it is those clubs with a community space which tend to have the highest rates of participation and the greatest camaraderie amongst members. It also fosters a real culture of volunteerism at community clubs as it is a way for people to remain a part of their community sporting club for many years after they have hung up the boots. Careful consideration has been given to how volunteers of the various community groups will use the facility. In summary, the facility is fit for purpose, has been designed for all of the community to enjoy and is in keeping with the Baronia Park plan of management and as such should be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Barbara Enright. Hello, Madam Chair and panel, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'd like to just say up front that this matter should not even be reviewed right now. There should have been a report that went back to council and the community. It's contrary to the council's own resolution of May 17. You should have that document in front of you. My, but my first issue is the fact that after living in Park Road for over 40 years, I was not, nor any of the Baronia Park residents, considered, considered stakeholders at all from the very onset of this project. How can councillors not include the ratepayers living opposite and around the proposed development as being of major consideration? That highlights the lack of transparency and serious manipulation of what should have been a proper process. My second point is in regard to the hijacking of the funds, which were allocated to refurbish the grandstand, as well as improve amenities for Baronia Park users. How can council allow interference with the lay of the land? This is not right to use grant money that was for our heritage listed grandstand and a new amenities block. In regard to heritage, the Baronia Park Reserve was proclaimed for public recreation in 1887, years before rugby and other sports were played there. Council has a duty of care to act on behalf of the whole community to provide a balanced and sustainable environment. Its values should, be, should include fairness, transparency and sustainable development. A council document dated the 11th of the 12th, 1991, addressed to the ratepayers, states that the foreshore, foreshore scenic protection area takes in all of Bronia Park. Yet our Baronia Park heritage area and the heritage listed grandstand has been violated with this DA to now want to construct a two-storey building right in the middle of our heritage area is a slap in the face to organisations such as the Hunters Hill Trust, Save Baronia Park, Heritage Land and Environment, Heritage New South Wales, Foreshore Scenic Protection Area, and the park visitors, ratepayers, and progressive thinkers of our community who have always supported upgraded amenities for women. If council were listening to and respecting the expert people it appointed to advise on this DA, it would go back to council and not be in favour of the overdevelopment that's to have some powerful lobbies behind it. Council needs to stand up and not push this through at the last minute. It is totally inappropriate to the general populace. 
If approved, this DA will be detrimental to our historical municipality. It's not what is needed. It's only what is wanted by groups that mostly don't even reside in the area and will not be affected by the disturbing and uncontrollable noise after dark. All our unique green spaces and heritage buildings have to be respected. Finally, if the truckers come to destroy our beloved Baronia Park, I'll be one of the first to lie down in front of the machines if need be. I demand Hunters Hill follow due process and do, do their job with honesty and transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Luke McCormack. Yes, can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you and the committee for uh, uh, hearing us out today. I want to speak strongly in favour of the development uh, as proposed. Uh, currently, I'm the senior club chairman of the uh, Hunters Hill Rugby Club, and I represent over 180 players aged between the age of 16 and 60, and uh, both men and women. I've also been a coach, player, parent, administrator, and volunteer for over 16 years with the club. And the point I'd like to make today is that uh, the, the, it seems that uh, uh, a lot of uh, what we've heard today is about sport and community being mutually exclusive. And I want to make sure that we really understand the value that rugby and more broadly sport brings to the community and uh, the things that we do as a club to make sure that we're enmeshed in the community. Uh, in my four years as chairman, our focus has been about giving back and integrating into the broader Hunters Hill community. An example I'd like to give is that at the start of the COVID pandemic, the senior club conducted a grocery drive in conjunction with Sydney Community Services, a local Hunters Hill uh, NGO. And uh, it was centered around a, a grocery collection that we actually had uh, gravitating around uh, Baronia Park as the collection point. Um, and the purpose of that was to make sure that our members understood that there are people in the community that are less off than themselves and to make sure that they're giving back. Similarly, this year, we chose the Red Cross as our adopted charitable partner. And that, again, is to try and imbue the importance of being part of the community to young men and women uh, as they go about not only their sport, but uh, as they mature as individuals. Over the last couple of years, we've also had a close association with uh, wheelchair rugby and disability New South Wales. In fact, uh, Paralympian uh, rugby player Andrew Edmondson was recently a patron of the club. And that also highlighted for us as members of a sporting organisation in the local community, the woeful facilities for those that live with a disability uh, uh, that visit Baronia Park. So it's not just about what we do in the community, but also providing a safe place for youth uh, that want to play sport. They want to play sport with their mates. They want to learn the values that sport delivers to them. And they want to, our job as a committee is to ensure that they're maturing and uh, becoming worthwhile members of the community. So while we hear a lot about um, what, what, what the facilities are required, and I think there's general consensus that a modern set of facilities are required, I think it's really important to understand that it's not just being a member of Hunters Hill Rugby Club and the local sporting associations is not just about what happens between the sidelines, but it's about being part of the community. And that's exactly what we do when we turn up there week after week. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, I commend the uh, development. Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Now, Miss uh, Sue Hoopman. <coughs> Sue, are you there? Sue? Hello, can you hear me? Ah, I can see Sue's iPhone. I presume that is Sue Hoopman, is it? It is. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can other members, can the other members of the panel hear Sue? That's confirmed. Right. Very well, Sue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this most detailed and much needed facility for Baronia Park Oval's precinct. I say this having been a Hunters Hill resident for over 40 years and been lucky enough to be elected to the council for 20 years 
and as popularly elected mayor of Hunters Hill for 10 years. Over that time, there have been many attempts to improve the facilities at Baronia Park Precinct for all the sports clubs who use it, the local school sports days, the events and every other activity held there. I will remember a local resident uh, who was an architect drawing up plans for renewed facilities under the grandstand. Resident objections caused the cancellation of that idea. Again, there was a Band-Aid implementation, as has been the case again and again and again. The facilities have been a disgrace for some time. Now is the time for renewal. This is the best proposal there has been. It is located far away from the residence, tucked between two ovals. It acknowledges the uses and the users. There have been many examples of community consultation on site and otherwise. It contains a detailed report on every aspect of concern from the users to the residents, including heritage, predicted noise levels, traffic management, consideration of the natural elements, even sleep arousal impact, for goodness sake. The residents should believe they are in good hands. I have met many of them and as none are 125 plus years old, they bought in this area knowing that it was a well-used community park that caters to a wide variety of needs. It supports the council's planning and controls and the Baronia Park Plan of Management. All user groups are well managed to implement and maintain the proposed conditions. Everything points to a successfully completed first-class facility at Baronia Park, and one that provides a great opportunity for the inclusion and promotion of women's sport. I wholeheartedly support the recommendation for approval. Congratulations to the staff on the detail of the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Kathy Inglis. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Cathy Inglis and I'm the president of Bladesville Ravens Sports Club. Um, Ravens fully supports the Baronia Park Community Facility Building, which addresses the needs of the community now and into the future. Bladesville Ravens is a local community club that was formed in 1960 and currently has over 1,200 members. We have 100 teams across all ages participating in netball, women's football and men's football. Ravens currently has 34 junior girls netball teams with nearly 300 players ranged from 7 to 16 years of age. And these are mostly local girls from Hunters Hill and Gladesville and Woolwich communities. Ravens uses the netball courts at Baronia Park for training and this new facility will improve the amenities for our female participants particularly to provide safe access for toilets and change rooms close to the netball courts. Community sports clubs like Glazer Ravens are not just about sport. They provide members and their families with the opportunities to participate in the community, build relationships and develop skills and leadership qualities. Local sports clubs and communities are not exclusive. They are integrated. Sports clubs bring together the community and help people build relationships. Social network is an essential component of community clubs and the new facility will provide a venue for members to get together for meetings and social gatherings. For Ravens, the new facility gives us the opportunity to hold events such as netball gala days and make additional use of the netball courts. The indoor space could be used for fitness training on wet weather days and for coaches and managers meetings. It would be great to have a local venue alongside the courts for easy access to our training equipment and storage. Currently, only some of our teams get the opportunity to train at Baronia and many are forced to go outside the local community to train at courts with better facilities. With the community room, we could run our development and mentoring programs for our young girls with classroom style learning rather than sitting on the netball courts. Apart from being the president of Glazer Ravens, I have lived in the Hunnersill community for over 50 years as did my mother and my grandparents. And I realised the value this facility will have in the area. The community building will be a benefit to all residents of the local area for many years to come. There has been a criticism that this facility is just for the sporting clubs, 
But if you count the number of children and families across all the sports that use Baronia Park and the students from Baronia Park School, this is a significant proportion of the local residents. We need to recognise the needs of the community will change in the future. The council currently has the opportunity with this facility to ensure that locals will not be left lacking and wishing for better facilities in the years to come. I fully support this proposal. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Alistair Sharp. Alistair, are you there? Good, I'm unmuted. Uh, Good afternoon. I'm speaking for the Hunters Hill Trust and I'll be speaking mainly about the upstairs. The downstairs part, I ha we have no problem. That is the, the changing rooms, the toilets and the storage. Um, as, as Bridget has said, they're in the wrong place, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to start off by saying that there is a serious problem with holding this, this hearing today because council did pass a motion on the on the um, 17th of May, confirmed in the minutes of three, on the 21st of June, that a further report will be provided to council following the assessment of the development application before consideration by the local planning panel. That didn't happen. So this meeting actually is not legitimate. But let's talk about what's proposed. A huge problem is the comes under the heading of financial impact assessment. And we query the accuracy of the statement that there are no direct or indirect risks impacting on council arising from consideration of this matter. No detailed budget has been released for this project. All we have is a lump sum budget. The business case says, should unforeseen costs arise, the project control group should be able to effectively strategize Savings elsewhere in the project. That's a bit vague. The agreement for license prevents construction of the building commencing before fundraising targets have been met. Well, so far, we have only this lump sum question of whether it covers the full cost of construction, including site works, services, fit out, and as we heard earlier today, um, remediation of the car park. It's widely, been widely publicised in the general press that the cost of construction has been increasing recently, but we don't have any provision beyond a, a 10% um, allowance in the original budget. I think, it, well, we think it'd be prudent to have a fallback design, which could consist simply of the lower level of this building. Now, as to the design of the upper level, the executive summary of the report says the upper level will be proposed to be used by spectators, but also proposed to be used by a wide range of community gatherings. The location of 220 people in total. Now, the only access to the upper story is a tiny little lift, the size to accommodate a wheelchair. So all the other access is by the staircase. These are shown as a single flight with no landing, meaning if someone loses their footing, they'll tumble all the way down to the bottom. They, the stairs emerge close to the wall, right in the middle of the, the access way where people will go up to the servery to get food or, or a beer. It's, it's the, the staircase has to be redesigned. There is reference to the word toilets, plural, in the upper level, but the drawing's shown only one. 220 people drinking beer need a lot more than one toilet. So the access is to go down the stairs to the lower level, but there are still no toilets at the lower level. The toilets are all outside. You have to go out, out of the building altogether to reach toilets. This is a very strange form of construction. And I'd like to um, reinforce Emily's comments about the inappropriateness of having the terrace as part of the entertaining area. 
because the terrace is shown as having full width concertina doors. And it's all very well for the acoustic, for the, um, acoustic report to suggest that the doors have, those doors have to be kept closed after 6 p.m. or whatever it was. There's no way that that could ever be enforced. It, it's absurd. And in, in wintertime, everybody's going to want to be standing outside. Sorry, in summertime, everybody's going to want to stand outside on, um, on the terrace for the cool of the, of the evening. Basically, this is not a very competent design. The upstairs just doesn't meet the requirements that are stated. And I suggest that it has to undergo, a, either be abandoned or undergo a complete redesign. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicole Sarpi. Nicole, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, everybody. My name is Nicole Safi. I'm the Hunters Hill Rugby Club's Women's Vice Chair and have been a member and player of the club for four years. I'm here today in strong support of the sports and community facility at Baronia Park and speaking on behalf of myself and the women's program in particular. I don't need to stress the importance of having accessible facilities for girls and women to participate in sport at Baronia Park or anywhere. Women's sport is growing at an unparalleled rate in this country and across the globe, which means we need to meet the needs of, needs of the swelling number of participants. I think we can all agree that change rooms and amenities should cater to all people in equal measure. As a community, we should be creating spaces and opportunities for girls and women to participate where they and we are not made to feel uncomfortable or like a second thought. Unfortunately, that is the case at Baronia Park currently. And fortunately, this is what the sport and community facility at Baronia Park seeks to do, make us feel not uncomfortable or like a second thought. Another thing the facility seeks to do is create a physical space where all people, girls and women included, can come together have a laugh, share stories, and celebrate a game, tournament, or competition won or lost because that's sport. I've reflected on this before, but earlier this year, our group won the inaugural Subby Sevens tournament, and with that, a trophy for our efforts. Today, that trophy sits in a dusty shed. How nice would it have been to celebrate that proud moment in the club and community's history in a community space as a team? 20 odd women with our fellow senior and junior club members, proud of our efforts with the trophy placed proudly in a cabinet. We cannot underestimate the value of a space where people can come together and connect, not just sports people, all people. The physical benefits of participating in sport are irrefutable, but we should not forget the social, mental and emotional benefits of the connection and friendship that come after the full-time whistle especially for girls and women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joshua Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I've been tuning into the meeting while at Baronia Park Public School with my class, who are the future of the area. So they are very keen for this facility and got excited when I made some highlights on what this would provide to the area. We are perhaps the most regular user for the whole year. We will make our way down um, at least once a week. And this is coming back, the current restrictions are that we can now go down again. Every time I use the facilities down there, uh, an the important role of being a teacher and the sports coordinator of the school is that I have a duty of care for my students. Every time we go down this facility, I guess what I would say it puts puts my duty of care into question. Just using a toilet, they must disappear from my line of sight. Sometimes if I'm downstairs at another field, they must um, travel more than 200 metres just to go to the bathroom. And that whole time I am entrusting students as young as eight to be responsible. I cannot control certain things, but I do like to control a lot of my life. Um, the safety of getting down and using the facility is always in question. The term rat runner has been used today. We have to lug equipment down every time we use it. 
and we do entrust some of the equipment to the students. We are quite good at getting usually 300 kids down to the Oval and work as a team. I would like everyone to work as a team and get this facility off the ground the best that it can be and provide the maximum for the investment. It is, an, it is going to be a legacy, and I've mentioned and spoken about this before, that we are proud of our school at Baronia Park. I think this facility would only add to that. It would not just be a sporting facility, but we have quite a strong community feel and include environmental education and also music education. A facility provided like this could only be a positive for our school. We are a public school and this sort of facility is a dream. If it was provided to us, my safety concerns and my duty of care would not be questioned and it would only improve the entire um, suburb. They're my main points. Volunteer hours for sport are so important and lots of teacher hours are put into this sport and to make sure that our safety is tied in with that and the best possible facility. I can't wait for this to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that brings to a close the public part of this panel meeting. The members of the panel will now <clears throat> go into their deliberations on the application for the development consent and they will then return after their deliberations to advise of the decision. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Could all panel members please hold on. Thank you everybody for attending. No, they go. Means that all the people who were speaking have now spoken. I think. Yeah. All right. Unmute.